Twitter is essentially the global public square. And if you start acting out in a global public square, the police come and take you away. And a massive transformative purpose is what you're telling the world. It's like, this is who I am. This is what I'm going to do. This is the dent I'm going to make in the universe. Welcome, everybody, to Moonshots and Mindsets. I'm here with one of my dearest friends on the planet, uh, an extraordinary thinker, someone who, you know, Salim Ismail, all I can say about you is uh, we have fun together, and uh, there's probably no subject we will not dive into. Uh, sometimes we dive in uh, and hit the bottom of the pool, <laughs> and sometimes we fly. How are you doing today? I'm very well. I'm doing great. Yeah, those of you who don't know Salim, uh, he was the first president of Singularity University. We can talk about how I conned him into running SU. Uh, he was the head of the incubator, uh, was it Brickhouse or Brickworks? Yeah, Brickhouse. Brickhouse at Yahoo. Uh, he's the head of Open EXO. He and I are writing a book together on exponential organizations. It's the second book in the series. Salim wrote the first one. I was supposed to co-author but my publisher wouldn't let me do it. Long story is there. Uh, godfather to my two boys. Uh, Salim, where are you today, pal? I'm in Miami dealing with the hurricane. Uh, yeah, that's right. I was talking to my mom, and she's in Boca and uh, dealing with the same thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a pain in the butt. Uh, luckily, It is. In I'd... fact, it's one of the reasons uh, we came to Miami eight years ago from the West Coast uh, was because we ran a bunch of numbers and worked out that in about 20, 25 years, uh, Miami's gone, so better enjoy it while it's here was one of the, <laughs> was one of the rationales we have for getting here. Oh, my God. You know, I wanted to always create a, a map of the United States that had, like, the dangers laid out. Like, you know, Miami, you know, Florida would have hurricanes. California would have earthquakes. You know, uh, the Midwest would have boredom as the major disaster that you – anyway. I need it's – and it's kind of incredible you. <laughs> what you would do. And you know, people moved to the Pacific Northwest because they thought it was safe. Uh, and then you have wildfires, unexpectedly heat waves. I remember talking to climate gurus about the, the heat wave last year. And they said, we can't even create models that encompass that. Like, we're just, we just can't even replicate that. Well, you, you know, uh, uh, Seattle area and the Pacific Northwest is in for a massive earthquake sometime soon. Yeah. I mean... I mean it's it's one of my favorite stories of of the inability of human beings to deal with systemic change. Um, Which is? It's worth telling the story if you if you yeah if go for religious. it. I've got so, all the time in the world. So in 1700, there was yeah. like a nine point something earthquake, one of the biggest ever, uh, 50 miles off the coast of Seattle. Took out a thousand miles of the coastline from Vancouver all the way down to Oregon. And so and there's been rumblings under the water recently. So they've been look, going, hey, wait a minute. Uh, so they start researching and they go over to Japan because they worked out that this must have created quite a tsunami uh, and asked, hey, did you see a, a tsunami? And sure enough, at that time, exactly a stonking huge tsunami came over the Pacific and took out half of Japan. It's that big. So they're like, wow, this is oh, great. We found it. Fantastic. And they're starting to leave. And the Japanese researchers go, oh, wait a minute. You know, this happens repeatedly, right? And they're like, wait, what? And it turns out because the Japanese have been keeping records for thousands of years, it turns out every quarter, every 250 years, like clockwork, this happens. And a giant tsunami comes over and takes out half of Japan every time. Oh, my God. Years. So they come back to Seattle, kind of really unnerved, and start looking at tree rings and core samples and find out, holy crap, this is the earthquake. It's been happening roughly every 250 years for 20,000 years. And the last one was 300 years ago. Yeah. So any minute now, <laughs> this earthquake <laughs> is going to go off and take out a thousand miles of the So coast. if this podcast releases on the day that happens, I don't know if it's going to be prophetic or people are going to blame us for it. Well, you know, what blows my mind is if you ask people in Seattle, many of whom know this story, you go, does this affect your decision to buy a house, whatever? No, they are, everybody's merrily going about their lives as if nothing happened. That part I don't get. That part, like, we're so bad at that. Well, it's, it's, the, human, it's the human challenge of we're dealing with, we don't actually value the disasters that are coming uh, in any way, shape, or form that makes sense. And we, all we focus on is what's happening this morning, like in politics or on yeah. Twitter. Well, as you're say. fond of saying, everything important happened within a day's walk, right? Yeah, I mean, that's, um, the, bra yeah, that's the mind. The human mind evolved 100,000 years ago, a million years ago, and it was nothing that affected you that was not within a day's walk that you care about. And nothing changed generation to generation. It was always the same. And, yeah. and that innate wiring 
is a pain in the ass right now. <laughs> it is a pain in the ass. We we actually, I think the only way to solve humanity is an intervention into our brain chemistry and brain makeup. <laughs> I that, mean, it's really the only way. Is that plant medicine or is that... Uh, I think that, that those uh, are the beginnings of it, but there's all sorts of uh, other mechanisms, whether it's uh, brain uh, computing interfaces or something. But we need, we need an intervention because we're kind of operating off our limber, limbic systems for so much of it, right? Like the news cycle that you like to talk about. Yeah, it's, it's still the animal brain. We're, we're operating from a position of fear and scarcity. And yeah. it's, um, it's a problem. I, um, I remember when I was researching this, um, we had a, this lizard brain, and then the neocortex evolved very, mm -hmm. very fast. Um, and when you talk to anthropologists, it was literally like a tumor cre got created. It's, it's a couple of million years ago, uh, we created the frontal lobe and, and the yeah. neocortex. I mean, it's and, fairly and what, recent. What, when you talk to those guys, it, what's amazing is how fast it grew. It didn't kind of evolve a layer by layer by layer. It went from half a liter to 1.5 liters almost overnight in, in <clears throat> genetic terms. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it didn't replace the old brain. It just sits above it. Yep. And so uh, this is where uh, religions I often call the ultimate marketing, because all religions work by taking a young child um, with, whose neocortex hasn't fully formed. You give them a bunch of absolute truths like Jesus is the son of God, Muhammad is the last prophet, Mary was a virgin, whatever. And then you bind it into them with ritual repetition and a lot of sweets. Uh, and once it's wired in, you can't get rid of it. You provoke it later, you end up with a fight or flight response. Uh, we are so screwed. Um, <laughs> yeah. Hey, thanks for listening to Moonshots and Mindsets. I want to take a second to tell you about a company that I love. It's called Levels, and it helps me be responsible for the food that I eat, what I bring into my body. See, we were never designed as humans to eat as much sugar as we do, and sugar is not good for your brain or your heart or your body in general. Levels helps me monitor the impact of the foods that I eat by monitoring my blood sugar. For example, I learned that if I dip my bread in olive oil, it blunts my my glycemic response, which is good for my health. If you're interested, learn more by going to levels.link backslash Peter. Levels will give you an extra two months of membership. It's something that is critical for the future of your longevity. All right, let's get back to the conversation in the episode. Speaking of screwed, how are you feeling about uh, uh, Elon and Twitter these days? I mean, it's... You know, I could go both ways on this. Um, on one level... It's a very, very complex problem that you can't just take a meat axe to, right? Mm. So, so you've got a one end, um, you want freedom of speech, which, in which case you get this vomit of, of racist and misogynist crap. And on the other end, you want advertisers. And so you can't have both. And so you have to pick which one you want. And managing that balance is very, very uh, delicate. I think the way to think about this is... Twitter is essentially the global public square. Mm. And if you start acting out in a global public square, the police come and take you away. Yeah. You can't just stand there and, and, and throw out stink bombs or, or uh, start shooting people. Wait, or wait, you, if you, you can't, because if, you do, if the police don't come take you away, the people it, who are worth hearing or you know, speaking to go away. That's either, right. Either we keep some sanity or not. But it's, it's interesting. I, I remember... Um, so I think Twitter should be a utility. And it should be an open, it's the commons. And it yeah. shouldn't be owned by one company. And it shouldn't be, uh, it should be delicately moderated by government, but not heavily. What, you want to make Twitter a government organization? Well, no, but, but if you have a town square, you need some governance around that to say you can't drive your cars through it at high speed. You can't just yell at everybody that goes by. You have, we have norms that, that operate and laws that, that work for this. And you need some of those laws. Well, let me let me slow this down a second and, and talk about um, the fact that Elon, on top of all the other things that he's doing, you know, <laughs> launching rockets and, uh, uh, and brain computer interface and yeah. reinventing the energy ecosystem and drilling tunnels, decided to jump onto buying Twitter. I, and I, I, but here's the other question: How, you know, I know he tweets. I, yeah. I direct messaged and tweeted and, and all of that. But I mean, the volume, I, I can't imagine he's putting all of those tweets out himself. There's got to be an army of. No, of, there's, there's, I'm sure there's an army of tweets. The one person that I know that actually edits every tweet that, that uh, he, uh, before they go out, is actually the Pope. 
The Pope huh. actually looks at every tweet put out under his name and unauthorized. Oh, I thought you were, I thought you were saying the Pope actually edits Elon's tweets. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, there's there's definitely an army, or he's he's so uh, active on that that he's not. You know, I I think many of us with that brain of his would rather him focus on the really hard problems, right? Yeah. Uh, well, listen, I'm an investor in in Tesla and in SpaceX. Full disclosure, so I'm not happy he's spending his time on on Twitter. Though I remember years ago when I asked him what would you what would you want to uh, conquer next, uh, he did have a vision. He called it Pravda, which uh, is sort of the you know the the Russian version sure, of truth. Sure, newspaper. Yeah, um, and and so if you could advise him, would you go back and say don't buy Twitter? Oh. I think if he could go back and undo it, he would do it. He would choose. They're trying to do forty-five billion is a ridiculous amount. I think the actual value. So um, I know a bunch of the ex-Twitter engineers, and at Brookhouse, okay. many of my guys went and worked at Twitter and vice versa. So, so what, are they, what are they saying? They basically think it's really worth about ten to twelve billion. Mm -hmm. um, so forty-five billion is absurd at one at one level from a revenues type type of thing. However, however, let me spin the other way. If there was somebody that could take on Twitter and go after it, it would be Elon, mm -hmm. right? Because he's got the gumption. He doesn't give a damn. He, he can focus on what's the best thing to do and just do it. Uh, but I think that, that that tension between free speech and advertisers will, will kill it. So the question is, how many things can he give a damn about is the biggest challenge. I remember back in 2004, uh, he joined my board of trustees at XPRIZE. I was on yeah. my way to go get Larry Page to join the board, and I called Elon, who I you know, could call on a regular basis back then before he became techno god incarnate. Um, and, uh, and I asked him, would you join the board? I'm about to go meet with Larry Page. I want him to join our board. And if you're on the board, he may likely join. He said, yeah. And that was it. And Larry joined the board. It was great. Uh, uh, fast forward eight years later, he calls. He says, listen, Peter, I, I need to... I'm, jumping off all boards other than SpaceX and Tesla because I need to focus on those companies. And he did um, until now he's on everything, doing everything <laughs> at the same time. So yeah. how many things can, I mean, the guy is, people don't realize how extraordinarily brilliant he is. He's not just the CEO of Tesla. He's the chief engineer, right? I mean, mm. the Merlin engines, the uh, Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy, Starship, they have emanated from his mind. Uh, he is, a, you know, genius extraordinaire. And and Tesla, while he didn't originally found the company, much of its vision, its execution, hundred um, percent, is is him. So yeah, you know, the question becomes: if he's not building spaceships and reinventing our energy ecosystem, um, you know, what is he? What is he? How does he spend his time? I mean, look, solving the public discourse problem is a worthy problem. But it, it, it's not an engineering problem. It's a cultural problem. And so given the incredible engineering nouns and gumption and capability he has, he's better off focusing on brain computing interfaces or avatars or getting us to Mars. Uh, we need an off-planet strategy uh, desperately the way we're doing it, right? Yeah. And so uh, my, if I could, you know, something we could do is put together a cabal of 10 or 15 people and and he he has to do what the vote what the connective vote is of what he should focus on. <laughs> Don't focus on that. Focus on that. Yeah, I mean the challenge is he's never found anybody who he would have be the CEO of Tesla. Yeah, uh, I mean he's he's I've had these conversations where he said like you know if I could find a CEO to run Tesla who is a great CEO that I could trust, please I would love to have him do that so I can focus on SpaceX. You know, going to Mars is, in fact, his number one objective, uh, making humanity a multi-planetary species. So uh, it's the, the biggest challenge is not the value of Tesla. It's the, it's the, uh, it's the time division multiplexing of Elon's brain. Um, you know, and I don't know. Uh, I hope he settles it. I hope he finds somebody who can run it for him. Uh, talking about current uh, sort of massive... Uh, situations going upside down uh ftx holy shit yeah well uh, you know i a uh when i had a bunch of my people who are kind of deep in the crypto web3 world they've been saying to me for about a year and a half that ftx is, is not going to work um they're offering insane 
interest rates. And at that level, you get into a Ponzi scheme. So that's great for short-term market penetration. But at some point, that, that's going to come back to roost and you burn through your cash reserves. So it's kind of, uh, there's a few big hand grenades left in the crypto world to, to deal with, Tether being one of them, and the, and the, the credit worthiness of the USDC and Tether. Uh, but once we're through those, I think then we uh, actually see this as a positive thing because it's clearing out the, the, the crud for all of the incredibly worthy projects that are out there. So I think we'll hit bottom at some point in the next uh, two, three months. I think there'll be one more big sell-off as we hit tax, end of your tax things where people have to reconcile taxes. So there'll be a bunch of selling and buying. I think January, we start a new bull market in crypto that'll be incredible. Yeah, I was <clears throat> watching some of the predictions, both from Kathy Wood uh, and from, um, uh, who is our, our buddy? Uh, well, besides Michael Saylor, no, our buddy who bought all the uh, Bitcoin in the auction, um, uh, Draper. Hmm. Um, you know, it's, we're going to hit quarter million, a million dollars. And, and so, uh, you know, people keep on predicting these highs, but no one holds their feet to the fire when they keep on missing their, uh, missing their predictions. It's like it's, I guess it's just easy to predict it's going to be at, you know, 100,000, a quarter million, a million dollars well, of Bitcoin. I, I mean, I, I hope I'm it in, is. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in the maximalist camp, right? Yeah. Um, um, the, it, it either goes to a million dollars of Bitcoin, it goes to zero. In my yes, mind, I, agree, I agree with that. I agree right? with that. It's so either now, becomes if a you've got asset. something that's ten thousand, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars, and it's either going to go up to a million or down to zero. This is the biggest asymmetric bet you could ever make. That's a good point. Right? So, so you put in a uh, hundred grand, it's going to go to zero. Or it's going to go to ten million. I mean, it's a really easy, it's a really easy equation to put some I mean, money against. I mean, would you mortgage your house and buy Bitcoin? Yes. Now, I, I say that. Um, and I may be completely wrong just because the, a, a, a bet on Bitcoin is a bet against the existing monetary system. Well, that's easy. And then therefore, it's a, the question is not if, it's when, right? Yeah. And yeah. so when you have that kind of an equation, as long as you're willing to hold for the long term, then uh, you're fine. Uh, so I think that's the way to think about it. And I'm, I'm super fascinated by the different experiments. And it's worth actually touching on why Bitcoin is interesting right now with the three triangle points. Sure. Let's do it. Um, so there, uh, Jeff Booth talks about this. I think of Jeff as the kind of the patron saint uh, or the chief economist of the abundance world, right? And he, he thinks about monetary systems and the transition between them. He, he made, gave me a great framing. He said, you've got three things you have to hit from a crypto perspective. Uh, security, decentralization, and scalability. And those are three important uh, um, kind of uh, bullet points to hit. The uh, Bitcoin, for the first time in history, solved decentralization and security, and nobody mm -hmm. had ever done that before in a in a in a digital currency. That's that's huge to be able to solve for security and decentralization, uh, but it didn't handle scalability very well initially, and so sure. that's where you got the rise of all the altcoins because they handle <clears throat> secure the scalability very well. So people got very excited, but in doing so, they all compromise on one of the other two. So you get all coins that are scalable, but not decentralized. Mm -hmm. um, you get all coins that are scalable, but not secure, but decentralized. But you don't get any of all three. So you had this problem. With, and so they're often called shit coins by the Bitcoin world for that reason, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but now with the Lightning Network and Liquid, we now have the engineering capability to make Bitcoin scalable. Uh, and and when people were moaning about Bitcoin scalability, my my thing was always, wait, that's an engineering problem. It's not an invention problem, right? We've solved the invention problem. That's huge. Engin scalability is an engineering problem. We'll we'll solve that. We always do. And so now we've solved the engineering problem. So now Bitcoin hits all of those three layers. That's why there's people that are so excited by Bitcoin. What's fascinating for me is the smartest people I know are the most excited about Bitcoin. The goddamn smartest. So yeah. that's an interesting indicator. One of them actually told me um, your ability to invest in Bitcoin is, a, is your ability is literally an IQ test for the future. I, I, I was going to say that. It's, uh, it's, it's definitely uh, something now, I think about a egotistic, lot. Egotistic, of course, right? But still. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you and I were both. I this year I gave the Ayn Rand Award 
uh, the Atlas Award to Michael Saylor, and you were there as my, my guest, and that was fun. I mean, seeing Michael Saylor on stage at Calamigos accepting that incredibly beautiful award uh, and waxing uh, uh, beautifully about Bitcoin. I mean, yeah. I, th I think at the end of that evening, everybody wanted to pull out their Coinbase wallets <laughs> and to start buying. <laughs> yes. And, and it, if, if for, for the people listening, if you've not seen the Michael Saylor Ayn Rand acceptance speech, absolutely go see it. It's a brilliant piece of oratory because uh, he talks about the fact that we now have freedom. It gives you freedom, right? No government can take it away. No, uh, uh, no company can take it away from you. Once you I, was, have it, I was talking to uh, uh, to a dear friend, a mutual friend of ours, Dave Blunden, uh, who's on our board at XPRIZE. Yeah. And we were talking about uh, the future of using cryptocurrencies in African nations, uh, both to replace their currency, but also to create contracts for uh, for land ownership and real estate yeah. ownership. You know, the reason I wouldn't go and invite and in, invest in beautiful real estate on the coast in, in various African nations is I don't know whether I'm going to own it at the end of the result, whether it's going to be a revolution. But if there is, uh, you know, a cryptocurrency that is secure, if there is a uh, ability to track uh, ownership on the blockchain, um, I think that could open up massive investments. Uh, it it does. You know, so I was talking to Hernando de Soto, the famous economist who's done a lot of work on property rights, especially for the poor, mm -hmm. right? And he, he uh, so there's 280 trillion of global real estate value. And he worked out that if you put land titles on the blockchain, just yep. did that, uh, you'd release about 10% of value because they would be analyzable, transferable, um, look-upable, ex referenceable, et cetera. And that's a massive number. Uh, to to think about the challenge you have there is the immune system problem because when you say the blockchain will be authoritative of who owns what land and you take that provenance away from governments they really really don't like it no right? you'd have to have a government that wants to do this yeah i mean so and, look at what happened with el salvador pal so el salvador uh goes and adopts bitcoin yeah um and it it was a huge fanfare at the beginning and we don't hear much about it anymore Success, yeah, failure. that's because, in my opinion, it's because it's working. Okay, what you hear is a lot of negative stories. The IMF is going bananas on this because if mm -hmm. a bunch of other countries start adopting it, you have massive change in the hegemony of the U.S. dollar, and that's mm -hmm. a, a big challenge. Um, it's when you talk to people on the ground in El Salvador, uh, it's amazing. It's actually working really well, transferring Bitcoin around for payments and stuff. Uh, there's a bunch of corruption at the government levels, as there is always, but it has enabled microtransactions at a very local level in a very powerful way. Um, I know a bunch of small countries that are looking at this very aggressively for this for exactly that reason. It's it's this is a this is the biggest inflection point in 500 years, right? Where we're taking sure. power, monetary <clears throat> power, away from a centralized government and giving it to a peer-to-peer -peer environment, and so. Uh, this this is you know when you talk about scarcity to abundance it's that level of a transition i think it's in my opinion this what we're going through right now is the biggest transition in the history of humanity like this next 30 years will dictate uh, the next 300 years of humanity well it's it's everything i mean we're reinventing fundamentally what it means to be human and what it means to have a society yeah every everything uh, that's why i like it. your framing of we must be living in a simulation because it's too goddamn interesting. Yeah, we're, we're at the 99th lay of level of a 100-level game. And yeah. it's all playing out during our lifetimes. Uh, and it truly is, but we'll get to a simulation later. So uh, we watch F FTX just skyrocket, right? And Sam Bankman-Fried becomes a hero for every MIT grad and every uh, you know techno entrepreneur out there. And then it crashes. We've seen... Uh, you know, NFTs and entire Luna. Uh, systems, you know, so, I mean, easy come, easy go. Is it, is it just basically if it's moving, if it's skyrocketing too fast in value, should people be, you know, do you sell at the top and diversify? I, th I think there's, I think you have to look at two reasons why things are exploding out of the gate, right? One is that the fundamentals are unbelievably strong and therefore track those carefully and there's a long-term commitment by the project founders, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then there are the quick get-rich-quick schemes and things that are that are engineered for short-term 
massive value creation, but not long-term sustainability. And uh, from what I've heard, the FTX model fits into the latter. They they did it, they were offering massive interest rates for people to put money into FTX, etc., which is essentially you're creating a Ponzi scheme. At some point, that has to come home to roost, and when it does, then the whole thing tumbles down like a house of cards. But you know, it's so easy. that's one one big challenge. Yeah. The second is there's a lot of the crypto world is very much the wild west. There's a lot of manipulation. Uh, Luna got taken down by a bunch of manipulation by. Mm-hmm. Uh, vested interest that didn't want uh, an algorithmic model like Luna had. I mean, you you invested heavily into the NFT world in the, in the early days. Yeah. Um, was it, you know, hype or was it real? I mean, whenever there's something that is not providing real value, when it's yeah. all perceived value, I get concerned. Uh, you're yeah, minting it, bananas. <laughs> yeah, yes and no. So, so... <laughs> Yes, there's a ton of hype. As you use the thing, you have something new. Let's take the 99.com boom, right? Everybody and their grandmother creates a website, you know, pet food online and, and you know, grandmother shoes online and, and whatnot. And then you have this massive culling of the herd because you, 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 it's that Gartner hype cycle. Sure. Uh, and you go through the trough of disillusionment. And this is what we're in now called the crypto winter. So a lot of the projects that are crazy flame out. And I'll give you an example of one. I won't say the name, but there was an NFT project that launched about a year ago where the guy said, a guy got up and said, listen, I'm I'm selling 2000 NFTs, buy them for an Ethereum each. And I'm going to do such amazing stuff for the community that you will, it'll blow your minds. Okay. That, that was it. He didn't say what he was going to do. He He raised 2000 Ethereum in 50 minutes. Right. Okay. Now, uh, two thousand and four thousand dollars. That's like eight million dollars or something insane like that. Okay. Yep. Um. Uh. In fifty minutes. Okay. Now the thing you look at that and you go, okay. <laughs> um. If you apply the smallest common sense filter to this, a he's it's basically it's a security because he's promising returns. B. Uh. Um. He's not saying what he's going to do. Uh. And C. This is full used car salesman mode. Right. So For sure. a project like that, you kind of go, yeah, not not into, into it, okay? Uh, you take say the Board Ape Club, which is also has elements of the hype, but of which of which both. you're a of which you're a member. I have a Board Ape uh, yes. number fifty three oh four, right? Now, when I have a Board Ape, a it's mine in perpetuity. B I have all the IP uh, rights to that, so I could go create a movie or put it on T-shirts or do whatever I want with that character, which is kind of surreal. But you get connected into a community. Right. Um, then they start offering things to that community. And what they're doing is what they what the crypto economics for these projects that are good is they offer high rewards over for the early adopters and then they tail off over time. And now you've built a thriving community. OK, now the Board Ape Yacht Club is still worth like something like a billion dollars in a year and a half. Um, I've I, I took some lessons from my guru. Michael Johnson, who's been guiding me through this. And he said, the minute you get land or you get ape coin, whatever, sell it. Mm-hmm. Right. So I've paid back all my initial investment twice over, and I'm still sitting on my board ape. And it's a, a fascinating community to be a part of, to see what's going on. Now, the reason I'm excited about NFTs is that you can program the NFT. So for me, digital currencies and cryptocurrencies are not interesting because they're digital. The U.S. dollar is digital and has been for quite a while. The fact is I can program the money, and I can't program a dollar bill, right? So imagine I buy your uh, sweater that you're wearing. This looks like a very nice sweater. Okay, and Thank you. The price of $100, mm-hmm. okay? A, and a system in the future can say, right, I'm going to send you the $100 in crypto. It holds it in escrow. You know not now know that I've sent the money. You send me the sweater. I receive a sign for the FedEx receipt. And then it releases the money to you. So we can programmatically manage that transaction and no fraud is possible in that transaction, which is kind of an incredible thing for two parties that don't know each other. Right. So now we can scale. This is a hugely important point. Without this without a without a central authority. Without a middleman. Like right? eBay this, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And if you if it's worth it, I can I can touch on the Byzantine generals problem, for which for me is the magical piece of you gold. You know, I remember in two thousand and 11 or 12 when you started talking about bitcoin i mean we were on stage together all the time for yeah. at singularity university running the executive programs and running the uh the uh, gsp 
program. Uh, and I remember the first time exactly where I was sitting when you went over the, the, the Byzantine generals uh, problem and explained Bitcoin to me. And uh, the only problem was we need our time machine to go back and say, Peter, just put, you know, 500 bucks in. You know, I didn't do it. I know you didn't. I did it a bit later. Otherwise, you'd be buying dinner next time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably be buying dinner anyway. But the the uh, there are you know the enthusiastic you know uh, for example I watched real time the Ethereum ICO. Yeah. Right? And there was a piece of me that's like throw a thousand bucks into this. Why not? Like go for it, right? Mm. And there's another piece of me going, what is this thing? I don't get my head around this this Turing complete system. I and my brain was just not the size of Vitalik's, and it wasn't young enough. Right? Mm. There's some bylaw you have to be under 25 years old oh, to understand. The well, well you're, there's, there's, no, I think you have to be under 25 to have not seen all the things go wrong that people, you, you become more dubious. And also the agility and the what the hell factor. Well, uh, think, uh, let, me, let me flip it the other way. Take somebody that's a banker and yeah. they've been, they're 60 years old and they've been in banking for, you know, 45 years or 40 years. Okay. Their brain is so entrained and all the neurons are so entrained on fiat currency, et cetera. When you show them Bitcoin, they literally get hives. Like they, <laughs> they can't go, right? And this is the, the, we all have that to some extent. You know, we had that famous interaction about SU a few years ago. Yeah, where, I we had an offsite and you said, hey, uh, um, and I asked the question, you know, we should think about what would SU look like if we had to recreate it today? Mm -hmm. And it was about eight, nine years. And you said, okay, and the board said, okay, go think about that. What would it look like? And I tried four times to do that exercise and I failed miserably because we were so successful in what we did initially sure. that my brain kept going back to that, right? And so that's, and that's clearly the wrong answer because e e Facebook didn't really exist and, and e-commerce e sites didn't exist and MOOCs didn't exist. And there was no, we, we would do things incredibly differently. And it's incredibly difficult to step outside your old paradigms. This is why psychedelics are interesting. Uh, well, it gives you a, a accelerated path to break through some of these old m mental and structural tr cognitive traps that we have. So we're recording this on the day after uh, November 8th, the, after the uh, U.S. Uh, midterm elections. Yeah. And talk about a system that has been sort of uh, ossified and stuck, and that's democracy. Uh, so we're, we're voting through a representative democracy. Um, yeah. And we're, we're doing it in uh, using a system that's hundreds of years old. Um, and I'm... I'm just sitting here uh, thinking about how archaic the process is. Uh, you know, it's, it's better than any place else, almost, but uh, still archaic. Um, what do you think about the future of democracy here, pal? <sighs> um, <laughs> where to start? Okay. Um, uh, so important for people to rec uh, just hear a couple of things. I, I, I've lived in eight different countries for more than a year each. Mm -hmm. Right, I've lived every from India to Europe to the U.S. to uh, California, all, all, all of California <laughs> and Florida, which is a separate world of its own. Um, and and uh, um, so I've seen different systems, yeah, and across the wide spectrum of socialism to uh, pretend democracy in India versus here, etc. And I think the U.S. Constitution is the most important document uh, created in the last half thousand years uh, because it enshrines individual rights. Uh, into that, and then in, 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 uh, kind of dictates to Congress and Senate to pass laws around it. Almost think, all individual rights, not almost not, all, but at least yeah. it makes an attempt for the first time in history to do that. Yeah. Now, what I get, go bananas over with the conservatives today is that they go, they have this concept of originalism, and they want to go back to what the founding fathers thought, and that's actually completely wrong because they intended it to be a living document that should be amended from time to time because they recognize. And I think of the constitution as the software that runs the country, right? Beautiful. You have to upgrade your software now and then. Yeah. Uh, times change, values change, you know, slavery is an obvious example, et cetera. So, so having said all of that, um, uh, the challenge that we have with democracy is the metabolism of decision-making and change in a democracy is too slow for the change of technology. For um, sure. Almost all policy is defensive and reactive. Right, something happens, and we we kind of go, oh my God, you know, drones or Bitcoin, and what do we do about it? 
and we try and tamp down on it. I mean, po- a policy with the FAA with getting yeah. uh, um, vertical flight rights. Zero, and yeah, zero G flight and, and, and space flight. I mean, the reality is most laws are in place to maintain the status quo yeah. and to keep the uh, the primary players uh, as the primary players. Any, That's right. dis- any any revolution, any breakthrough fundamentally disrupts the existing socioeconomic structure that exists and puts everybody who's funding the politicians in danger. And, and let me do a shout out here, right? You and uh, Stephen did something incredible in, in abundance and bold mm-hmm. where you recognize mm-hmm. that people see something new as danger mm-hmm. because they've never seen it before. And it triggers the lim- the, 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 the um, amygdalas, yeah. The, lim- the amygdala. Right. Yeah. And then you go, oh, my God, we should autonomous cars. Oh, my God, it might kill somebody. Let's ban the car. Right. As Brad Templeton says, we people don't want to be killed by robots. They'd much rather be killed by drunk people. <laughs> right. And 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 that's a terrible response to a new idea that clearly has uh, incredible value. So we we kind of block the entrance of new ideas. And then we open that tap slowly and it takes 20 years to get the value of that technology. And that cycle we have to break. Um, yeah. And we were better at it than we used to be, but it's still too too goddamn slow. With all of the 20 Gut- Gutenberg moments that we talk about or asteroid impacts that are changing the world, the advent of CRISPR and crypto and, and solar energy, etc., we have to get better at implementing this. So my view on democracy is big nation-state democracies are going to fail. Mm-hmm. I think what succeeds is micro-democracies at a city-state level. Um, I mean, so this is, is this Balaji and uh, his... his. Uh, uh, I, I open... disagree with Balaji uh, on the network state in a couple of important ways. Okay. Uh, it's brilliant thinking and it's very important thinking. Okay. Mm-hmm. But I think when the idea of city-states um, um, and the, the rise of city-states came to me via Paul Sappho from Singularity, right? Sure. Paul Forecaster, Futurist, and he talked about this in detail. 10 years ago. And he got up on stage and said, I don't expect the U.S. to exist as a country in 30 years. Wow, that's a pretty went, provocative statement. Pretty <laughs> provocative statement. So everybody went, wait, 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 wait hold on. <laughs> and he was getting off stage and we had to like yank him back and go, you can't, you can't make that comment and walk off. And he said, if look at the discourse that's happening. The country is literally pulling itself apart. And he gave us a couple of really interesting nuggets. I'll give you two of them. One was, uh, everybody in the world knows who the mayor of New York City is. Mm-hmm. Nobody in the world knows who the governor of New York State is. That's Even true. New Yorkers don't know who the governor is. <laughs> right? and, and so there's this the importance of the city. And he gave a second anecdote. When Schwarzenegger was governor, uh, the Dalai Lama wanted to visit Hollywood, visit L.A. And George Bush said to him, please don't receive the Dalai Lama. It will cause me massive problems with the Chinese. Right? And the sitting governor of California said to the sitting Republican president, and they're both from the same party, Screw you, I'm receiving the Dalai Lama because it's important to my constituents that he comes. And he's like, that tells you that there's a gap that's increasing. Yeah. And we're we're moving to city states as the future. When you think about Brexit or Trump, it wasn't left versus right, it's urban versus rural. Hmm. Completely. Brexit was completely London <clears throat> versus the rest of the country. Yeah. And you look at the map from yesterday, right? The election <clears throat> map, all the urban centers are blue. And everything else is red, right? It's completely, that's the fundamental tension of the 21st century. So in that model, city-states, micro-democracies work. National democracies don't work because they're too slow and it's too hard to bring a whole population along. And then you have fake news and all the other things, difficulties in this. So India, Brazil, uh, the U.S., all a mess. You know, one of the conversations you and I have had as well is which countries are going to be best suited for an AI-enabled future, right? Mm. So uh, uh, communism did not work when it was humans actually trying to decide how much supply and demand would be done in different places. Because there was no yeah, way. It was, it, was, it was the marketplace that enabled incredible rise of capitalism. And, and full disclosure, listen, I'm a libertarian capitalist. I love capitalism. I'm an entrepreneur. It's my art form. I love starting companies and I love democracy and all of that. Having said that, if we're getting to human level AI by 2029, I just had a, a podcast with, with Ray 
and uh, Ray Kurzweil and you know Ray sticks very much to his 2029 date. We're going to have human level AI, which means 2030. We have superhuman level AI, and it doesn't slow down after that. There's no on-off switch, no velocity meter. It is on a tear. And wow. so, what happens if uh, the the leadership of a city, state, or nation says to the AI, "Listen, come on over, be my partner. You run the situation over here." Um, you know that. That might be an interesting future for uh, for running a nation, uh, but it, it's not going to work in a democracy where no AI is going to wait for to get a human opinion. It's going to say, yes. no, 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 this is the answer. I've done five billion simulations and it's come out the exact same every time. So just I don't care about your wetware uh, opinion on the situation. This is what you should do. Yes. What do you think about that? So, oh God, where to start? Okay, so I publicly disagree with the idea that uh, AI is dangerous. I agree with you. I think AI okay. is the single greatest tool we have for solving the world's biggest problems. Yes. And I think when you have, if you get AIs that are human level and you end up with AIs that are conscious or whatever, I think they look at human beings, they transcend us and they go, oh, nice people over here. Uh, <laughs> and, and a nice little it, species over here. Little, little and, puppies. And they go off. And the best movie, the best representation, I think, of this is the movie Her. Her, yes. Right? Her was amazing, where, right. Where they the got, bo they dates, got bored with us and they left. That's right. The guy dates an AI <laughs> and he falls in love with, of course, it's Scarlett Johansson. I wish he could, they could do that better. But okay. He dates an AI, falls in love. And after a while, the AI breaks up with him. Why? Because she can now interact with 10 million other AIs in real time at scale. And he's one little limited brain talking about what he ate for breakfast, right? And and so I think what will happen is the the speed of evolution will move so fast, they'll just go, and they're gone. Uh, yes. And they'll live in the internet, et cetera. I remember talking to Dan Barry, who is our robotics um, yes, our, our so astronaut. Yeah. We asked him a question in one of the sessions of, is there a system today? Because the challenge with AI and consciousness is when will you know? Because mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a definition for consciousness. We don't have a test for it, right? You look like you're self-aware, so I attribute self-awareness to you. Thank you. I think I'm self-aware, but my wife, Lily, disagrees. Right? <laughs> so, like, where do you even start the, that conversation? Um, and and so we asked the question to, to Dan. Uh, he's watched a ton of animals in labs because NASA does experiments with free-floating <clears> animals, <throat> et cetera. And he said, huh, I think the I think a frog is, where, is the boundary point. And we're like, frog? <laughs> he goes... In his opinion, a frog uh, is is sophisticated enough just about to know that, oh, I'm a frog. <laughs> it has that level. Like a dog definitely knows it's a dog, right? Uh, yes. A dolphin definitely knows it's a dolphin. In Dan's opinion, a mosquito doesn't know it's a mosquito. Okay. It's just an automata wandering out. But the level of a frog kind of gets you to the boundary condition of, uh, oh, I'm a frog. Okay. So that's one <laughs> okay. observation that the level of a frog is the kind of uh, uh, level, level of, of consciousness, awareness yeah. of yeah. the thing. Okay. Now it won't be that hard for an AI to get to that level, right? Now, so we asked him, is there a system today out in the world that has the requisite inputs, outputs, processing, where it might suddenly go, oh, I'm a system and generate self-awareness. Right. And he went, huh, let me think about that. So he goes off for a day and comes back and goes, I have an answer. Um, I've thought about the different systems in the world. And his answer was traffic systems. Okay. In his opinion, traffic systems have the input-output feedback loops and the processing that one day it might suddenly go, oh, I'm a traffic system, right? <laughs> and that begs two questions, okay? One, what would it do? Mm -hmm. And B, what would we, well, how would we find out that it did that? <laughs> like, we would not know. We have no mechanism for, for seeing this. So I tend to be less paranoid about the AI side when I think about the her vector um, it's going to be utterly fascinating to see where this goes. And there's so much unbelievable benefit that will come. I think it's incredible. Hey, everybody. I hope you're enjoying this episode. I'll tell you about something I've been doing for years. Every quarter or so, having a phlebotomist come to my home to draw bloods, to understand what's going on inside my body. And it was a challenge to get all the right blood draws and all the right tests done. So I ended up co-founding a company that sends a phlebotomist to my home to measure 40 different biomarkers every quarter, put them up on a dashboard so I can see what's in range, what's out of range, and then get the right supplements, medicines, peptides, hormones, to optimize my health. Uh, it's something that I want for all my friends and family, and I'd love it for you. If you're interested, go to mylifeforce.com. 
backslash Peter to learn more. Let's get back to the episode. So going back again to the question of democracy and AI, talk to me about, you know, in the future, we have human level AI. Yeah. How do you feel about turning over leadership to an AI and saying, these are the things that matter to our society? I mean, let the human sort of set the objectives. Like we want yeah. maximize happiness. We want maximize health. We want maximize whatever and run the nation state for us. Let's use an analogy, which is the Google energy conserving AI that they applied to their buildings, right? Yep. So they deployed a machine learning intelligence to analyze all the sensors and lights and, and energy usage and said, "How we want to optimize for uh, energy conservation. And the AI, because it's got access to so many different inputs, outputs, calculation capabilities, was able to, what, drop 40% their energy needs, right? which like is that. a massive amount. A human being can't do that because it can't monitor this stuff in real time, etc. So when you think about what AIs could do, if you said, hey, maximize for conserving human life, you basically take the, the, the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, right? Say, go generate the policies that uh, will and the legal structures that will maximize for these things. Right? And, and I think you come out with something quite incredible where the AI could. So I think that's one side of it, which is policy and regulatory generation. And you could create policies around this. OK, um, I'll give you one that I would love to throw at this AI, which is Please. stop signs. Okay. The amount of fuel we waste coming to a full stop at front stop side and the and the brake power and the energy wastage of a million sure. cars coming to stop. Of, of no, <clears throat> nobody's no stop human line. no humans, no dogs, no cars. I mean you could know. You can have imaging it's not better that than hard. the human. Yeah. Not that yeah. hard, right? You need two sensors, one at the stop sign and one in the car, and you're done. And and we should really solve that problem. And AI could kind of go, oh freaking just go do that. And well, I mean, this is, the, this is the autonomous right. car solution, right, where cars are actually able to uh, drive closer to each other at higher speeds and have yeah. far more efficiency. Uh, That's right. And, and we'll get there. But it's the idea, first of all, that we're turning over decision-making capability to an AI in a car and then yes. even turning it over to an AI to a in, le in a government and leadership, right? Because, I, I listen, if you believe... And I think you do, and I do, that we are going to reach a human level AI. Um, I would, I personally would rather have, if I knew the AI was able to maximize for a set of human desirements uh, and safety and health and all of those things, I'd much rather have an uncorruptible AI that isn't influenced by the color of my skin or my gender or my age or anything. Uh, yeah. be making decisions. So I would, it's very, for me, it's very simple. Okay. We have Asimov's three laws of robotics. Yep. Okay. You basically say to the uh, AI, these are your constraints mm -hmm. or something similar, right? Uh, don't kill or allow a human being to be killed, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then do the instructions that we give you uh, as long as they don't interfere with the first two. Okay. Uh, and then you trust. Now, we trust our existing human beings with those things. We trust our police not to uh, kill people, not always successfully. I'd much rather have an AI policeman mm -hmm. than a real policeman who's got all his regular biases. He's having a fight with his wife at home. He had an army wound uh, and was shot at, therefore has a trigger response. You have no idea what they're going through. And the stress of being on the job with guns everywhere, right? Um, and, and then basically the AI should be able to say something like, for frick's sake, why do you need guns? Get rid of all the guns. Yeah. And you could make some good decisions that way. As You and I see the, the same on those politics. So when do you think we will have, uh, have this? Let's go to the, to the Ray Kurzweil uh, 2029 prediction in a second. Human level AI by 2029. We're yeah. seeing the rapid rise of uh, large language models. GPT-3, GPT-4 is coming. Yeah. Uh, DeepMind made its announcement about Gato. You know, yeah. I think the tweet was game over, uh, AGI, uh, artificial general intelligence is coming. Uh, what's your what's your thinking on this? So let's really be careful not to trigger the amygdala. Yeah, because the first I, thing that happens is people go, oh, my God, this bad. It must be bad, etc. OK, mm -hmm. let's notice. Let's take as a fa uh, an important principle, Ray's commentary that technology is the most important is, is a major driver of productivity and progress in the world. 
Actually, technology might be the only major driver of progress we've ever We're seen. not getting more intelligent. Political systems aren't becoming better. So it, it... Um, I would argue with that. Okay. How would you argue with it? So if you look at uh, your, all of the stuff that you track on abundance, right? Yeah. Um, poverty and mortality and maternal mortality, infant mortality. The big challenge with technology is how do you get the promise without the peril? Right. Okay. You, you want to have fire that will heat your house and not use it to burn down your. Rig. We've overall done a pretty good job of it. Over we're the still we're centuries. still here. We're still yeah. here, and we're overall pretty like thriving. You know, I, I'm I I so love the positivity framing you have in abundance in all your talks because it's so important for people to see the real reality that we're better off today than we ever have been in the history of the world by by such a law, huge factor. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just go back. 500 years ago, somebody goes off, uh, a husband goes off to do something and never comes back because he got killed <laughs> by a bear. And the wife never knows, no idea if he's ever coming back. Has he run off or has he been killed? Kids are being raised. Now what do you do? Do you remarry or not? I mean, there's a million chaotic things like this. I have a, a, a very banal example that I like to use uh, for today's world. Um, people go, oh, my God, technology, we know, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Cell phones are bad. I go, you know, if you're waiting, if you're a couple and you're waiting for your babysitter to show up 20 years ago and they're late, you have no idea. Are they coming? Are they not coming? Should we cancel the restaurant reservation? There's all this consternation and uncertainty and unknowing around what's happening with the babysitter because you can't do much until the damn person arrives, right? And now we have infinite knowledge. They're running three minutes late and ways. You're, 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 tr you're tracking their Uber, right? Yeah. We have exact, yeah. uh, we can say, call a restaurant. And we have, people don't recognize the unbelievable peace of mind that a million examples like that give us in the form of technology. Uh, and so now we accelerate that radically. And I think when you look at AI, it's able to look at the complexity of policymaking and say, listen, uh, Mr. Mayor, you're allocating resources in the wrong way. Uh, you could achieve this by doing this, this, this. Uh, I think initially it starts off as a, a guide by the side and a, a reference check. And over time, people go, it's great that you want to make that policy. Have you checked with your AI yet? Okay. Before we got to babysitters and policy changes, we were talking about what made the world better. And I said, yes, 100% it's technology. We haven't been improving ourselves cognitively or whatever. And you said you disagreed. But putting that aside... Technology is making the world uh, rapidly better at a rate that is staggering. The problem is, of course, and I'm going to do my rant that I have to, which is the crisis news network, the, all the negative yes. news bombarding us constantly with every murder, every problem on the planet. That Streaming we didn't actually... in real time to 20 devices in HD. Yes, over and over and over again. <laughs> yes. Ten times, an hour, ten times an hour. So uh, when are we going to see this AI uh, that is going to help us govern and yeah. when are we going to see it accepted in society is there a, is there a pivotal moment that people are going to say yeah i think i'm going to allow it um to govern yeah. because let, let, me, let me use an example okay yeah sure okay so let's use a real example pandemic hits and there's a bunch of uh news and stories and misinformation about masks should we wear masks or not right? Mm -hmm. Massive, like, consternation. Governor DeSantis over here in Florida is like, masks never work. Uh, chuck the masks. I mean, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, I, I would have a really interesting, it would be a really interesting use case to have an AI, Jarvis call it, yes. right? Or my, Kip, my favorite. Depending no, on no, no, no. Let's, let's stick with Jarvis. I love Jarvis. Jar let's stick with Jarvis. And the Jarvis goes, hey, I've done the clinical, I've researched this already, I've scoured the web for this, I've looked at it. The clinical trials and the experiments are very clear. If you wear a mask, you prevent 75% infection outward, and somebody else wearing a mask present, uh, is able to stop 25% of inward infection. The combination gives you 90% effectiveness. But at least wear a mask to prevent outward. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay? That's very clear. That There's no controverting that evidence. If better evidence emerges... Great. The problem is that uh, we are we've we've used to operate policy and so on on an evidentiary basis. Well, even worse, than, even worse than that, we would ignore the evidence and and state what was 
what was most politically uh, efficacious for us. Exactly. And almost always you go to the, you're affecting the person's limbic system. Yeah. Fear. Right? They're taking away your freedom. Yeah. We're all fear, about freedom. Right? Fear, and, fear and scarcity. But, and, I, uh, and I love getting into arguments with Republicans on this. And I not, don't mean to harp on Republicans, but everybody sits there and goes, we need freedom. Like if I drive three miles over the speed limit, I get pulled over by a cop in the U.S. Where's in your freedom Europe, now? Canada, because it's a free country. In Europe or Canada, I never even see a police car, ever. <laughs> like, you want freedom? Let me drive a little faster, for God's sakes, right? Um, so there's, 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 uh, there's such bullshit around the, the kind of the pat generalisms like freedom or okay. whatever. And it goes bad, just as bad on the left in its own way. So going back so to the now, question. So go back to Germany. Wh okay. when, so, when are we going to see the system... Uh, enabled and and adopted. Uh, now, oh. humans don't adopt new systems until they're 10 times faster, 10 times cheaper, yeah. and yeah. the switching cost is worth it, yeah. right? So, okay, so I think we're almost there. So think about this. Uh, I, I, I have my uh, mobile phone, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting in Miami and a hurricane's coming. You are, and it is. Right, and I can say, um, Hurricane Nicole Tracker, uh, show me when the hurricane will hit Miami Beach. Right. right. And the the AI says to me, um, uh, it's coming at tonight and that'll be the danger point. And maybe that's when you move your car to the second level of the car park or whatever in case there's a storm surge. Is there going to be a storm surge? I don't know. But the, but the AI will know. Sure. Right now. So you take one step further. We're only one hop away from the from an AI tracking our behavior and looking at our world of activity and going, hey, He's sitting in Miami. His car is parked on a ground floor thing. Um, there's a storm surge coming. He will need to move his car by X. Or, or right? better yet, I will move your car for you. You know, take over and optimize. Protect me. It's, it's yeah. ultimately take care yeah. of me. Is right. And, and, yeah. and we're we're there. I'll give you another example. Um, I wake up one morning and my left big toe is blue, and I'm like, why the hell is my toe blue? No blood circulation. What the hell happened? What do I do? I look it up on Google, mm -hmm. and and research it myself. I figure out what the condition in it's some Latin sounding name. Uh, and this is how you treat it. And I literally, you will print that out, take it to a doctor and the doctor will go, what the hell is this? And how did you figure all this out? Because we now have better understanding and we can analyze all these conditions better than a doctor yeah. can and self self treat for the vast majority. Right? So if you're, if I just put an AI go AI, my toes blue, what the hell do I do? And it scours around and comes back. Uh, uh, even better, or my bodily sensors will go, hey, dude, your toe's about to turn blue. Please do these three things to prevent that. So we're like, we're like right there. And, and Ray said something very profound in one of the recent talks. He said, look, we talk about implemented uh, uh, hardware that can mm -hmm. connect, but your phone can iterate much more effectively. So all you need is the communication capability uh, between you and the phone. And we're just about there between voice and other sensors. We're just about there. So, uh, so I give it a year. You you give it a year before I what? I give it a year a before, year before you what? have a Jarvis type AI that can handle initially basic things. We do calendaring now with AI pretty well. All right. right? All right. So let me let me piece this down for everybody listening because it's really important. Uh, I talk. I, I say to all the CEOs that I mentor, listen, there are going to be two kinds of companies by the end of this decade, those companies fully utilizing AI and those out of business. And I think it's that black and white. Um, so uh, let's begin with Ray's prediction, 2029 for human level AI. Do you believe that that is correct? By whatever uh, I measure, disagree. you think it's going to be sooner or later? No, I disagree because I disagree with the premise. Let me explain what I mean by that. Dude, it's Human so hard to get AI. an answer from you. I'm sorry, I know, you, you, you can't just take put out a thing like a path thing like human level AI. The problem is we don't know what AI, what intelligence is. Okay. Right. So there's about a dozen facets of intelligence. There's spatial intelligence. Yes, emotional there's many, intelligence, many different descriptions. The Eastern concept of presence or awareness. That's a whole other form of spiritual intelligence. Uh, we have our we with the IQ test you measure two things: uh, speed of thought and the ability to match concepts across frameworks. Okay, but you don't measure any of the other things. So what mm -hmm. the hell do you mean by intelligence is number one question, right? And the second question, which is why I go even doubly more crazy, is what would you, you know, we talk about the technological singularity is intelligence, machine intelligence overtaking human intelligence. So number one, I have an issue with what do you mean by intelligence? 
Number two, the minute I can prescriptively describe a task, a robot or AI is going to do a much better job of it anyway. So it's a non sequitur. Yes. So, so when you say human level AI, I come back to you and go, what aspect of humanity are you talking about? Now, if I can have an AI that makes me more present, that's really valuable. Or, or routes around my emotional biases. By the way, I want, that, I want that AI, you know, we have all these cognitive biases that we don't actually notice that we're hitting. Like when I look at somebody yes. or I hear something, an AI that is simply saying, Peter, you're being biased about, here's the actual data and the way you should see it. I mean, Boom. most people will turn it off, I think. But, uh, but, but think about that. How far are we from that? We're, we're, we're literally, that's not a difficult thing to, yeah. to do to track my language and go, look, you've got a positivity bias. You think everything's going to be so goddamn rosy, you need to tone it down a notch. Right? Well, uh, we, you and I don't have that. We're, we're not. <laughs> we're, we're, um, we're, obvi we're obviously unbiased, and we're not techno-optimists. Well, you know, you know, when you see things that can transform the world for better, how can you not get enthusiastic? Right? It's like the water extraordinary. Abundance, uh, yeah. Machine uh, X Prize, or the Avatar X Prize. Like, amazing. Yeah, we, we, right? just had it, we just had it one in, uh, in Long Beach, a uh, team out of Germany. Uh, won the uh, ten million dollars from A and A uh, Airlines. So, so we've got human level AI, however you define it, multi dimensional human level AI coming. Okay. okay. Um, and uh, have you been tra speaking about Avatar? Uh, you've obviously been tracking uh, Optimus, uh, Tesla bot, right? And there's other companies uh, like Beyond Me and uh, Sanctuary. So Boston we're going to Boston Dynamics. We're, well, Boston Dynamics is like sort of large scale. These other companies are are focusing on uh, re human labor marketplace, right? Yeah. Being able to create a a bot for, uh, you know, Elon says twenty thousand or less, less than the price of a car that can be available to do labor for you. So yeah. I want to transition. I want to talk about that, but I want to transition as well to the idea of universal basic income because I've been thinking about this a lot in the world of abundance. Yeah, uh, can can I just cover uh, to say a co final comment on the robot side before we move to UBI? Well, yeah, wait, let's talk about robots first. Okay, and then um, um, my premise is that we're going to need to have AI and robotics change the global economy, and then we can afford UBI. But let's um, okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, I totally agree. Let's talk about robots. Um, okay, R robots. So I think it's coming for sure to have a general robot that can do household tasks and work tasks, etc. But I think it's further away than people think. And I'll use the analogy of autonomous cars, right? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the biggest predictive failure that we had at Singularity is we thought autonomous cars would be there in five years because... Brad Templeton was just, just because sure of about it. Because the technology is <laughs> there. Like, it's there. It's, you know, and his, his concept was workable. He said, look, you don't have to be you don't have human intelligence to, to drive a car. You need horse level intelligence to navigate around. We kind of have that. The problem is that it turns out to be deceptively difficult because you're often driving and routing around a pothole or there's a bike and, and who's overtaking another bike. And so you need to, you watch that and you see that. There's like a million little adaptive situations that you drive that you don't realize. And trying to counter for all of those without a sensor-based road system is very difficult. I think once you have sensors in the in the roads, then then driving becomes autonomous driving is a piece of cake, right? And the sensors become I, I, cheap. I, dis, I disagree with that, by the way. I mean, I think our eyes are just two human eyes, not radar, not LIDAR, not ultrasound, just two human eyes are yeah. what enables a human driver to drive. I, I, so I, I, so I uh, dispute this with experience because I've now driven a Tesla four times from Toronto to Miami and back. Yes. So I've I'm done autopilot. something like uh, 8,000 miles in autonomous, in the, with the Tesla in autonomous driving mode. Okay. Which uh, is listen, I, I'm not saying that, uh, uh, that uh, autopilot on Tesla is anywhere near ready, but right. I do believe that we're, we're going to be able to get there uh, it's it's a data processing issue. It's not a data collection issue. Yep, it could it could be could be right. So but, so but, so if it's but, if it's not uh, data, let me, let me give you one more one. Oh, we don't need sensor. We don't need sensors in the road if it's not a data collection issue. Okay, fair enough. We, but you need a ton more data processing and a lot a lot more use cases and interpretive things, right? But for example, I would normally overtake the bike, but, but my wife's in the car and she gets a bit nervous, so I'm going to take oh, hold it back a notch, right? There's these little min there's a million little nuances that we don't 
taken note. But let me let me go make the point in a slightly different way. Okay. Um, one obvious thing for a home robot is folding laundry. Yes. Right. And and we've struggled mightily with a a, a, ro- a robot that can fold laundry. You, do you remember the videos of Scott Hassan's Will Garage? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It can do a T-shirt. Yes. But really hard to do anything else, right? Like it's it's it, it turns out even I, I, more basic. I, it's difficult for me to do anything else. <laughs> I, I'll give you a third one, which is the vacuum robot, right? Yes. People buy a shark robot or a Roomba, yes. and it's great in in like twenty percent situations. But the minute you have a curved stool with a base that's a little odd, it doesn't work. And you end up spending more time arranging the furniture so the room <laughs> do, than then just vacuuming yourself. And people kind of go after a while, ah, I'm just going to do wait, it wait, myself. Wait, you're telling me that, that that's a problem, but governing is going to be your year <laughs> from now? <laughs> because, because government, because it's so language oriented, right? Uh, An AI can read a policy uh, paper and make way more sense of it than the human being can. Right, like to show me any congressman or senator that's actually read the 800-page legislation on any uh, bill they actually. Well, let, let's not go. Let's not go there. You need yeah, AI no. to kind of get your head around that. Yeah. By the way, it's, it's just, the same thing for same thing for medicine. I think the daily number of, of medical publications is like seven thousand a day. You tell me how many your doctor the, has read. The this Daniel morning. Kraft one is there are two thousand five hundred research papers on cancer published per day. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if you're a can- if you have a cancer doctor, you can ask him. Has he read the 2005 that came out yesterday, <laughs> the day before? The- no. Obviously, you need AI right there to to think about it. I just want to make one last point, and let's move on to UBI because I think it's so important. Yeah. I you know the the part that I find most interesting and fascinating around this is I use the uh, example of PageRank, right? Google's AI that's scanning web pages. And it's developing a unique intelligence. For, for those who don't know, uh, PageRank was the algorithm that Larry Page came up with while he was a grad student at Stanford that Scott Hassan wrote and that he and, uh, and Sergey created into Google. It was called PageRank. Right. Yeah. And, and scours a million web pages and scores them and, and tags them and categorizes them. PageRank has developed its own kind of unique intelligence of how to scour the bill- trillions of web pages in real time around the world. That's an orthogonal effect uh, and complementary to human intelligence. It's not replicative of human intelligence, right? Um, we are localized sense-making machines. Yes. So I think of AI will be, for the vast, vast, vast majority of use cases, will be complementary. And that should take a lot of the fear out of it. They're not there to replace human beings. They're there to amplify and augment. Just like my phone augments my humanity. I can video with my son. I can project empathy around the world. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So I think AIs are going to massively add to productivity and labor automation in a magical way coming. And the general thesis leading to UBI is that we've been increasing productivity with mach- machines for thousands of years, and now we get to a point where the productivity gains of technology allow us not to have to work for a living. Yeah, right? it's um, so. Uh, let me hit on a couple things on 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 humanoid robots. I mean, I love the fact that Optimus is a humanoid, meaning five fingers, two legs, you know, bipedal, and it fits and operates in our human built environment, uh, doorknobs, uh, car pedals, all, of, all those things. And if in fact he's able to achieve it, uh, and the thesis is he's gonna be using AI and sensors and capabilities built for, for Tesla's autonomous driving, um, it's a massive market. I mean, how many car manufacturers are there? You know, well over a hundred. And there, how many humanoid robot manufacturers are there? Like none. And if he can get it, I mean, I would want one. Would you put one in your in your closet? Uh, sure, I yeah. would love to. You know, you yeah, want. I mean, especially especially if you lease it out, right? So uh, think of a think of a twenty thousand dollar car. What's an what's a car lease going to be? Like four hundred bucks a month. So for four hundred bucks a month, yeah. you've got a slave robot now be nice to it because the world you know the robot overlords are coming um but uh, for 400 bucks a month you've got something that does anything you want anytime you want i mean that's the that's the vision yeah. and it's it it is going to so it, it solves a labor issue now uh, we're living in a time today in which the numbers when i last looked at them a few weeks ago we have twice as many job openings as we have people looking for jobs yeah um now that will change 
but yeah. uh, but the notion is most people don't take work because they love the work. People who are cleaning up hotel rooms and uh, you know cleaning toilets or uh, working at a uh, you know cash register, they didn't dream about doing that. They're doing that because they want income for their family, they want insurance for their family. So, is there a future in which uh, the work that no one wants, uh, going back to Dan Barry, it's dull, dangerous, or dirty. Remember those three? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, you know, can we get, can we get robots to do that? And then well, how... I think we've been doing that anyway, like mining robots and agricultural robots, right? Yeah. Shop for uh, it robots. It used to be 98% yeah. of human population was employed in agriculture. And now it's like 1.8%. Yep. Cause we've automated the hell out of it. And because you don't need uh, um, strawberry pickers and apple pickers. You have machines to do it all. And that is uh, difficult in uh, house. Uh, so I think there definitely will be automating. Our, our assembly lines have done a lot of that for us. I think what's more powerful is things get to cognitive abilities where people can handle most day-to-day -day task call centers and routing call centers, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, we're I almost love, there. Yeah, yeah, we're almost there. Uh, and I love the the writing software even is being automated pretty fast right now. I love the, uh, the there's a great example of bank tellers uh, around this. It used to be that when we created ATM machines, everybody freaked out saying, oh my God, we'll have millions of bank tellers out of the work. What will we do with all the bank tellers, right? And so there's this massive concern about robots taking all the jobs, um, which the first article that appeared about robots taking all the jobs appeared in 1964, by the way. I, I, but I love I love this story. I love this story. Can, can I tell it a different way? Go ahead, tell it. Okay, so there was this letter written by a group of Nobel laureates and top scientists sent to the president saying, technical automation is going to destroy the banking industry. And that letter hit the desk of Lyndon B. Johnson, right? People think about it as a recent event, but no, it occurred in, like you said, 1964, thereabouts. And it was people concerned about replacing room filled mostly with women copying ledger to ledger to ledger. Uh, and we have more bankers and accountants than we've ever had on the planet. Yeah. So the, 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 the second half of that is people got concerned. What will happen with all the bank workers if you automate banking? Um, the actual outcome was that because of cost of b building and running a branch dropped so dramatically, the banks just created a ton more branches. And the number of bank workers has not changed at all. So it turns out, and we have multiple examples of this, the Germany, the factories in Germany are all automated. Uh, there's nobody on the factory floors, and it's not like unemployment has dropped. We just move people to higher value work. Yes. And so it turns out when we automate, we don't lose jobs, we increase capacity. And, we, and with and the we... increased capacity, we have that much more economic activity and productivity. And the idea behind UBI is you get to a tipping point where you can now... People don't have to work for a living. Yes. It, this is, so UBI stands for Universal Basic Income, and it's the idea that you get a check and you can do with that money what you want. If you live in Alaska, you have UBI ready. Uh, the permanent fund, Alaska takes all of its oil money and it makes, you know, it distributes a portion of that to everybody. I don't know what the, I don't know what the, uh, the, the check size is. It used to be like $5,000 a year per person. Uh, if you live in the Middle East, uh, there are equivalents of that in Saudi and the Emirates. I was having dinner with, uh, uh, with Reid Hoffman two days ago, uh, and I asked him about UBI. And uh, I said, what do you think of it? And, you know, who should I be speaking to about it? We've had this conversation. I want to bring someone to t talk the, on the subject at Abundance 360 this year. And, and he said he's been, he sent me an email yesterday saying, I've been asking around regarding UBI. And he said, most smart people think that the numbers are still off and could be solved if we get the kind of massive increase in productivity that we hope for. Um, and so if we've got robotic labor and AI labor, uh, the first time I heard something around this was uh, Jeff Bezos said, in the future, we should tax the robots. So yeah. if you replace a job, uh, a labor job uh, that's normally held by a human with a robot, then you should tax the robot and that part of that money should go to pay the human who's replaced. Yep. It was something like that. I've heard something similar. If you automate truck driving, then you, you tax the truck driving companies, and that goes to pay for the drivers to find some other work over a period of time. Um, uh, the, the, it, it turns out the, the, the financials are very close to working. 
because it the key is the key and then you let's talk about two issues around ubi one is people get fat and lazy and don't want to do anything and that's the people worry about socialism and you're paying that's the, to do nothing. that's the that's the concern that's Will the concern. people use that's use the money concern. For yeah. beer and, tobacco, and the second right? concern is we can't pay for it and we'll have to raise taxes and it's just uh, this is a stupid idea. Those right. are the two. Now, increasing productivity will solve for one. And the second one is actually solved because of the 14 major experiments that we've seen around UBI. It turns out if you find the right balance where you give people enough to survive but not be happy, mm. that's the level, right? So you give people enough that they can make it and they don't have to work, but it's not enough that they, they they want to buy the new TV. They want to buy the nicer car. So they go. So then you have a, still have a thriving economy and a job market, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, and, they're going to use they're going to use the money to further their education, yeah, get better training, that's right. and they, go they, and get for, the job. For I mean, what's the number? Forty percent of the U.S. cannot put four hundred dollars together in an emergency today. That's insane. I mean, that's the most ridiculous commentary I've ever heard for the richest country in the world. Right? It's it's a travesty. Um, so I think the UBI side will solve for a huge amount around that. And the case studies are, we have a lot of data now. Entrepreneurship explodes under this model because people find their passion and follow it. Yeah. And the, the, you made a point. It's important. These studies have been done in the U.S., in Canada, in parts of Africa, parts of Europe, where a government has given a population of people who are at the subsistence level, if you would, yeah. uh, uh, it was done in Stockton, California. Uh, the yeah. mayor, Mayor Tubbs, gave five hundred dollars a month <clears throat> to a population of a few thousand people, and ninety-nine percent of it of them used that money to do further their careers. Yeah. Less than one percent used it for you know beer and tobacco. Uh, amazing. I mean, yeah. you and we've you seen the same thing in India. There was yeah. a famine. And they gave 4,000 people a UBI because they had to give them some money. And the, the, the government workers freaked out and said, you can't just give people money. How would, uh, they will spend it on alcohol and gambling. And how do we extract bribes if you just give it directly? <laughs> so, but they were starving, so they had to do it. So they said, just do it. And they tracked it for two years. And they found in the similar to the stock, stock to 95% or 94% went to clothing, housing, healthcare, food. Yes, right? and the attendance of those kids of those families at school doubled, yeah, because they were I mean, fed and clothed. I mean, it's the the challenge is that once you run it for a while, a government realizes, oh, we're not needed anymore, and then cancels the program because then you need government. Hmm. It's literally what happened in Canada and Manitoba. They ran the program unbelievably successfully, and the government came in and went, oh, wait a minute, well, this is terrible. We don't, you know, we literally don't need government. The challenge I think we have with UBI is to go from a taxation, labor, employment, job model to this mm. is such a huge leap. I have no confidence in our public sector to get us there. Well, the AIs will. The AIs will do it all. Yeah, the AIs will. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah, AIs will it... propose it, and then we'll have a big fight. Well, uh, I, I bow to our AI overlords. Um, so there's a term that uh, a mutual f uh, friend, Harry Clor, uh, gave us of technological socialism. Yes. Right. So uh, we talked about communism earlier on uh, being failed when humans were doing it. Maybe when AI is doing it, it'll be more efficient. Socialism in the same fashion where the, where the state is taking care of you uh, has failed. That experience failed over and over again. But technological socialism, where technology is taking care of you, right, um, yeah. is something that I think is most definitely going to come, right? Where you're Not AI just going to come. I think it's here already. Yeah. You know, so so socialism fails because you have centralized allocation of resources, which is A, inefficient, and B, leads to corruption. In a, yes. In a, inevitable, yes. right? I'm dictating who, which family should get what food. I'm in a huge position of power, right, um, as a bureaucrat or technocrat. So that fails. Um, um, the other side of the coin, when you look at the free market, free markets also kind of don't work over time because they get corrupted in their own way. But if you have an algorithm matching in Uber, matching driver and passenger, um, uh, optimized for close proximity to the driver and star rating of the passenger driver, etc., Uber is actually a socialist application. It's the sharing of assets amongst a large group of people. And, and this is, I think, it's a profoundly fascinating opportunity to bring in collective use of assets that gives us hyper-leveraged in terms of... Uh, 
uh, productivity and repeated use of it, et cetera. But I mean, it's, it's, it's not only the sharing economy, it's the, it's the shared use of assets. It's, it's the crowd economy, which is the shared using of cognitive assets. Yeah. Right? I don't All employ a person 100%. Yeah. My, my, my favorite example of a socialist application is a restaurant. Okay. Um, when you go and eat at a restaurant, you're sharing the table with other people that have just eaten in the cutlery the people have just used before you. It's not your cutlery or your plate. The food is coming from the same chef. It's actually a socialist environment. Um, and we don't we do that without thinking. We sit on an airplane seat that millions of other people have sat on. And we don't freak out about that. Um, I think this is definitely there for the taking and, and creating a, a capitalist or a, a market-based environment that's algorithmically driven gives you the best of both worlds in many, many environments. Yeah. So AI and communism, technology and socialism. Um, let's talk about the, the, uh, the elephant in the room here, pal. Um, we are living in a simulation, aren't we? <laughs> so as a Buddhist, life is an illusion. Yes. So on first principles, uh, yes, right? Um, uh, uh, David Roberts, I remember giving this point that he said, if you stretch the electromagnetic spectrum, x-rays okay. to visible light to microwaves and you stretch it out to the width of the u.s okay okay three thousand miles across the 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 visible light that we see entering our eyes is two feet oh my god out of that three thousand miles <laughs> so we live in that little narrow spectrum of reality when the full spectrum of electromagnetic is that much right i think it's just a great example of how narrow uh, our pathetic little eyes are Compared to what's, you know, you have uh, very, uh, things operating with x-rays and other things operating with sonar and, and all sorts of um, uh, infrared sensing, etc. So we, we are by, so that's one. Secondly, yes. when light comes in, it, your eyes revert it and our brain flips it back around. So it's an, it's an, it's an image that appears at your brain anyway. Yeah. And, and, and of course, we only, we only process a fraction of 1% of all of our sensory input because right. we can't possibly handle it. And we, we fill in the blanks uh, with our own imagination of what we think is actually happening versus what really is happening. I um, remember a couple of years into Singularity, uh, Lok Lemur, who used to run Lil Web, said, come and do a talk and pick whatever topic you want. So I picked neuroscience. I said, all right, let me do a talk on the brain. And it forced me to go talk to Divya and, and a bunch of neuroscientists around, okay, right. what, what, so first that question I asked them was, what is the brain? Okay. And it was unbelievable. They couldn't agree. Um, <laughs> so I, I finally came up with a, a, a sentence that they all agreed on. I'm, I'm going to try and remember it. It said, a brain is a fractal, chaotic, um, um, sense-making machine that may or may not result in consciousness. Obviously, that was it. Like, that was, that was this thing, oh my god! And that was the only one they could roughly agree on. So we've got so much amazing investigation analysis to do, right? On our, on our, on our brain. Uh, what got me interested in psychedelics was the fMRI studies that showed you can now see exactly what dosage of what psychedelic does exactly this to this circuit, mm -hmm. and now we have a feedback loop that makes it amazing. I was uh, listening to a, a, a program this morning on uh, the idea of does, does consciousness impact our quantum universe? Um, and it's, we know so little. We are, we are so filled with ourselves and our, our, you know, our bullshit every day in politics in the world. We're just scratching the surface. Uh, yeah. It's, it's amazing. You but, know, I did my degree in theoretical physics. No, I didn't know that. Uh, didn't yes, know my that. degrees, my bachelor's degree is theoretical physics. So you do three years of Newtonian classical physics relativity, and in third year you get quantum mechanics. Right? Tilt. And and then the first thing that they tell you is, okay, so you know that last three years, uh, just chuck everything, and, and now everything is a probabilistic environment where an electron has an 80% tendency to exist. <laughs> it's just, it, it's such a hard shift. It's such a hard pivot. Uh, it's, it's impossible. I've been fascinated by the domain ever since with entanglement and, you know, spooky action at a distance. And it really is true how, how absurdly little we actually know. 
But I want to I want to close out with uh, uh, two questions. They may be the same answer for you, but um, I ask all my guests uh, if you were to launch an X Prize. If I were going to say uh, I'm going to say Elon's going to fund it, I'm going to fund it. Salim, what is an X Prize that you would want? What's a pro grand challenge problem that you want solved? And you're you know full disclosure, uh, Salim is on the board of directors at the X Prize and has been on this journey with me for multiple years. Um, is there an X Prize that you would love to see launched? What is a challenge you want to solve? Yes. Um, I would like to see an X Prize that improved emotional intelligence by 10x and, and, uh, and by doing so, um, um, kind of cleansed out all the emotional trauma that we grew up with. Scratch the surface a little bit more. What does that look like? What would a, what would a team have to do to solve this thing? So the problem there is a, a little bit the diagnostic. What's the before and after test, right? Mm -hmm. The Ansari X Prize is easy. Take a plane to suborbital twice within two weeks. Great. Yeah. Very clear mm -hmm. metrics. Yeah, it goes back to the hard question, which is we struggle often at X Prizes. How do you define the domain properly? What do we mean by emotional maturity? And how would you measure it to increase it 10x, et cetera, et cetera? So there's some work to do in defining the boundaries. But I, for me, we, you know, there, there's two major problems that I see in humanity. One is in the West, we tend to be very logically driven and, and operate on just pure rationale and Western medicine, Western thinking, objective reality. Um, and so that's one danger point because you lose the subjective and the softer side, the spiritual side. Etc. And the problem in the East is you do what we what I what people call a spiritual bypass. Like in India, you grow up, you have all this family baggage that nobody deals with. You jump straight to being praying at a temple, and you never deal with the emotional baggage. You go straight to enlightenment. You go. You try and go straight to enlightenment, <laughs> and you and you and yet there's this carcass of family skeletons in the closet of, of crap that you're. Your grandfather is an alcoholic and epigenetically you're now an alcoholic and you don't even know it. And yet you have um, uh, tendencies in that direction in lots of different ways. And, and you, you've no idea and you don't know what you don't know. And yet you skip straight through to trying to achieve enlightenment, right? You can't do that without cleaning up all the rest. So I, would, I think a prize like this would balance both these out. It would also solve the problem of techies in Silicon Valley trying to go for technological uh, supremacy without really understanding the human nuances along the way, et cetera. So that would be the prize I would go after. Uh, okay. I think it, would, it would make human beings infinitely happier and more at peace with themselves if you could achieve it. And your moonshot, what are you working on right now that is uh, in the realm of moonshot, buddy? Uh, moonshot is, can we create a new model for society that creates a layer of resilience uh, in in our systemic global human society. So we have, if you look at the history of civilizations, every civilization got to a very complex level, the Incas, the Mayans, the Romans. Then they had some boundary condition and they instantly collapsed, right? Hmm. Um, I, I, like just literally hit a cliff and boom. Uh, every single one of them, by the way. Okay, this is, And if you talk to the Yuval Hararis and Neil Ferguson's of the world, all those conditions are there now where we're like, we're at that tipping point, we may be even sliding down and we don't know. Our monetary systems are an easy example of the crash in crypto today is one example. It looks like, by the way, Solana may be being wiped out today. Um, wow. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. It's, uh, it's, um, uh, it's down a massive amount today. Um, so uh, when, you, when you look at what's happening in uh, global human wow. society. Wow, Bitcoin's down to 16 something. Yeah, it's yeah. great. Buying opportunity. Um, <laughs> that's what mindset. <laughs> uh, yeah. So by the they're, way, they're, by the way, this is an entrepreneur's mindset. Everybody, this is how the judo move when it goes down. It's a buying opportunity, right? Big problems, fantastic opportunities to start a company. To you solve know, those um, the biggest problems are the biggest markets. That's your stock phrase. I, I think yeah. it's such an important um, way to think about the world as whole. Oh, huge problem, huge opportunity. Um, it, and I think this is maybe the biggest gift that you've brought to the world, Peter, is having people think at a global scale yeah. uh, via XPRIZE or Singularity. I remember I was I got together with a bunch of the Singularity alumni in Spain when I was there, and they're like, you, we hate you. And I said, what happened? He goes, you infected us. You, you get us <laughs> to think at a global level, and then you can't go back to thinking, how do I create a better mobile ad network? You, you yeah, just can't. No, You're it, stuck it's... at trying to solve systemic global issues, which is what we wanted anyway.
Yeah, no, it's, uh, and by the way, I can't believe we were both in Spain the same day, we, in Madrid, and we missed each other by like, like, like hours. So, We've had the opposite. Remember, we were, I was at the New York Hilton over, over Grand Central, and yes. I was typing an email to you, kind of going, really need to talk to Peter directly about this, and you were literally walking across the lobby by accident. Uh, I, I, so, I know. And um, how many times have we done that and didn't even know it? So Yeah, I have a so, teaser for your people. Okay, yes, for all the good. viewers. John yeah. Hagel and I, you know, we're talking about serendipity. Mm -hmm. uh, John Hakel and I, who does a lot of work in writing around engineering serendipity, have been working on a model, uh, and we've come up with like a very simple two by two diagram, where we define luck, and we can measure it. Okay. And I'll leave that there. For now. We're, we're, we're going to talk about this some other time, or we you're going to happily can. All right. Well, um, we'll, we'll, we'll come yeah, back. Yeah, it's that worth point. it. It needs a reveal because we need to finish it up, et cetera, et cetera. But it's it's there. We like because think about how much our lives run on luck and serendipitous events, right? Um, every single one of us, the most meaningful things in our lives were, were weird coincidences for the which there's no normal explanation. Yeah, oh, and we have plenty of those between us. We have plenty of those between like. us, right? And so, <laughs> so can you prescriptively create luck? In fact, the EXO book was actually a practice book for me at a crack at writing a book on luck. Okay, so which, is, which, is come, which is going to come out? You're going to write a at book on luck? At some point, John and I need to agree on the final framing and the definitions. Okay. But um, think about the exponential organizations. The first half is analytical. What is it? And yeah, so what are the attributes? Second half is prescriptive. And then we have a diagnostic test. And the second half is prescriptive. How do you start one, apply to mid-market and big companies, et cetera, right? And right. it was actually the practice run to say, could I get a meme into the world? Because luck is a really hard topic, right? Rookie author, I'm probably going to make some stupid mistake and screw it all up. Let me, uh, you know, exponential organizations is so obvious needs to be done. And then the book took off and I've not been able to get, get away from, from the paradigm yet. But John and I have been working on the side on this other topic because all of us, they think of any of us, our lives run on luck. Uh, well, they, they run on hard work and caffeine. and Those are the table stakes. Okay. Think of any Silicon Valley company. You have to be talented. You have to work your ass off. Yes. Table and, you, and you need then internet. Then you need that lucky break <laughs> to hit the right strategic relationship, hit the market at the right time with the right feature footprint. And that's actually what makes you successful. So how do you generate serendipity? Uh, so, you know, the, uh, there's a great TED talk and uh, a DLD talk by, uh, by Bill Gross. Yes. Where, right. And it, I, it, has to, it has to be related, right? Where he says, listen, he analyzed like 100 companies that succeeded, 100 companies that failed. And he said, what was the parameter that was the number one thing of all the companies that succeeded? Was the amount of capital they raised? Was, was it the experience of the, of the CEO? Was it the field that was in, they were in? And you know the answer to this. Yeah. It's totally uh, luck. Well, it was... It was luck by virtue of their ability to stick around. In yeah. other words, the companies that were able to last the longest intercepted a lucky event, like the yes. space shuttle space shuttle crashing and oh. being shut down yeah. was what launched SpaceX. The 2008 yeah. fiscal crash is what launched Uber and Airbnb. Zoom. Right? Zoom. Oh, my God. I was on a panel with Eric Yuan, the CEO of Zoom, a month before the pandemic. And he's saying, Jesus, you know, I've been working my ass off for several years building this, and I need that one thing to happen to help us take so, off. And, so and a month later, boom. Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> well, it is and it isn't. You I'm know, joking. Um, I'm joking. The Seneca it. definition that op uh, preparation meets opportunity is the best definition we've for yet sure. seen. Right? And for so sure. the question then becomes, how do you increase preparation? How do you increase opportunity? And can you live long enough to live forever, which is paraphrasing uh, Ray Kurzweil on longevity, but it's, it's true for companies. Yeah. I, I tell all my companies, listen, get to cash flow break even as soon as you can, right? Yeah. Make sure you've got years of lifetime because you're going to screw it up over and over again. Yeah. And you're going to run, if, if you're dead and you do not exist, there's no way to run into that perfect investor or customer but if you're able to hang on long enough you'll intercept the pandemic you know or the big you know this is maybe the hardest question is something's not working do you keep struggling or do you shut it down and start oh again? my god it is one of the hardest this is questions the black hole question we should talk about that next time because it's it's a you know i've i've had i'm now on my 27th company i think and there are those companies that i look back and say man i should have killed them far earlier 
Uh, I'm terrible at that. Right. I'm I've like taken, the worst I've taken money. Fast guy ever. I've taken yeah. money. My I companies linger forever. And yeah. I, I should just like be merciful and shoot them in the head. And I'm just, I'm bad at that. The ones that the, are successful entrepreneurs are the ones that just go Astro Teller, right? At Google Ads, yeah. they have a very specific thing. It's got, having these metrics or it's not. What will make it fail and test those first and then kill it? So we'll go, we're going to do this again, right? You and I on this, on this Happy podcast. To. Okay. We'll Anytime. add that. We're going to talk about luck. We're going to talk about how do you, you know, when do you kill your, your favorite child or company, as the case may be, and lots of other subjects. In fact, we'll, we'll ask people who are viewing this what they want us to talk about, and we'll do that. We'll catch up on where Twitter is and FTX and uh, democracy, where AI is. And, you know, pal, uh, I love you, and I'm thankful to have you in my life. Uh, likewise. I mean, the serendipity that brought us together is uh, pervasive in everything that happens in my life right now. Yeah. So, all right, brother. Like, have a see you soon. Talk soon, Peter.